so there's some problems in the world. What can I do about it? So there's some fires up in the interior. What can I do about it? <coughs> David is there, David Edgecombe. And uh, we need to pray for him, specifically, but to pray for the other people. Some people we do know have actually been forced out of their homes, but I wonder if it's maybe just a callous attitude. Well, okay, I'll give $5 or $10 to the Red Cross. What else can I do? Maybe the question is, what else can we do? But just to uh, think about it. There was a man, a very rich man, Henri Dunant. And he was a money changer. He was very rich, very influential. And he went, and uh, it was a thing in those days, this is a couple hundred years ago, to go and watch men fight on battlefields. And that's what happened. He went and he, he watched this battle. And afterwards, when the people were laying around wounded, people were dead, of course, but the wounded people were just left. He was so brokenhearted about this that he went into the little town of Sulfurnero, Sulfurino, sorry, it was not a, a Argentine, it's, it's uh, Italian. And he commandeered some of the ladies and the children to go out and heal people, just to bind up their wounds and to say, oh, let's do what we can. Sickness is actually more of a disease and, and killer than, than um, shooting people. In the American Civil War, over half of the people, twice as many people died from disease than ever died from being shot, and that was a horrible war. Henri Dunant went back and he says, I gotta do something about this. And so what he did is he organized a bunch of people and he founded the Red Cross. Christian man. Now he had troubles of his own at the end of his life. He renounced his faith, whether that was real or not, or whether it was just uh, the problems he was going through at the time, but he won the very first Nobel Peace Prize because he had a compassion and he did something about it. Do you have a compassion? What are you going to do about it? Uh, we're reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And let me read it while you're finding that place. Paul, here's the man, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the church of God at Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Did you get that? The only God is a God of comfort. And the only God says, I will comfort you, Christians, so that you can comfort other people. The one I have given to you, I expect you to pass on. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. 
then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. This is the most personable of all the letters of Paul. Sometimes if you read the book of Galatians, it comes down very harshly on those people who had believed in God and then were turning away. He said, don't you dare do that. And in the first book of 1 Corinthians, the first letter he sends, he is very challenging to them. They have their, their little groups of people. They have blatant sexual sin right in the middle of the church. They disregarded the Lord's Supper, and he had harsh words to say to them, to correct them and bring them back. But this second letter is his most personal. He pours out his heart. We see who Paul really is, and he lets us know. Even though you don't consider me, Paul, to be very much, I want to let you know I'm an apostle of God. God sent me to be here. You may reject me, but God says, no, I am. I am the sent one to you. The God of all comfort. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Well, we have the Father in verse, verse 3. He is saying praise to the God and Father. He is the Father of compassion and comfort. That's Him. And then in verse 5, we find Jesus is the one who gives comfort. They're together. Oh, hold it, hold it. Who did Jesus give to us that resides in every Christian's heart? the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so the whole Trinity, God himself, is vitally interested in your Christian life and comforts you in all situations. He is the agent of comfort. The agent of comfort. You know, when you get that warm, huggy feeling. Some time ago when our kids were little, you can ignore this, when our kids were little, there was a thunder and lightning storm one night. And one of our kids ran in, oh, I'm so scared, so they climbed into bed. Another one came, oh, I'm so scared, I even their friends climbed into bed. <laughs> I walked up on the floor. They wanted comfort. And the God of all comfort is the one who snuggles us in the midst of all of our difficulties. We love that, don't we? That God knows every situation. You know what? <laughs> he knows about it before we get into the situation. And he's a God of comfort. He's a God that says, listen, I will be with you in all of that. How precious are those truths. He's the agent of comfort. Ah, but listen, verse 4 is very key. He gives us that comfort, drops it on us, and lets us Give it to other people. There's a world of people who know nothing about the comfort of God. What you do, Christian, you can comfort them. You can comfort them. Paul says, boy, I, I want to let you know something. You did something in, after I sent the first letter to you, uh, you excommunicated that brother who was in blatant sexual sin. You did what I told you had to happen. You had to say, okay, this person is doing something terribly wrong. You have to take him and publicly shame him and put him out of the church. Excommunication. Oh, what a horrible thing to go through. For the church as well as for that individual. He was put out of the fellowship. He couldn't meet to break bread. He couldn't meet at the prayer meeting. He couldn't meet in the fellowship time. He could only come in and sit in an open meeting. And he felt that, that embarrassment and shame for his sin, as he should have. But in chapter 4, in chapter 2 of this second letter, he says, welcome him back. He just didn't cross his arms and say, oh, well, if that's the way they feel about it, I'm going to another church. 
That happens too often, right? No, he didn't. He was broken hearted over his sin. And Paul says, what I've heard is he's broken hearted over his sin. And what I want you to do to welcome him back in the family, in which they did. They comforted him, even though they had to be severe with him. And Paul goes on to say in verse 8 and 9, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered. We were under great pressure, so that we even despaired of life. Think about that. Here's Paul. God says, I'm saving you. You're going out to be my missionary over the whole world. And he even didn't know if he was going to die. He despaired even of life. But he kept on. Peace. If you go to chapter 11, he pours himself out. I was flogged five different times. I was beaten over the back with a rod three times. I was shipwrecked three times. And on top of all of those physical pain, you kind of get the impression. I think most of us would say, uh, maybe I'll just go home and, and just sit and read my Bible at home. Sometimes what happens is somebody says, you're a Christian? <laughs> you get it? You go to church? Oh, I don't believe it. And we say, oh, well, it's okay. It's okay. And you just sort of shy away and you're so embarrassed, so ashamed. Oh, we feel so sad. Paul says, I, I've beaten up. It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Talk about a type A personality with, you know, on steroids or something. Mine is. Put yourself in Paul's place. If you went through that severe suffering, would you turn around and go away and say, well, that's it, I'm done with that? Or would you renew your commitment to Jesus? Look what he says in verse 9. Indeed, our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Just as Jesus had a sentence of death above him, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, and he died. So this was Paul's situation. He had a sentence of death. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We have all kinds of problems in life. Let me tell you that. We all know about all kinds of problems. How do we get through this situation? Paul was probably on a sick bed. Maybe he was dying. And yet what happened? God resurrected Jesus. He can resurrect you. He resurrected Paul. So that's where our focus is. Not on the, the struggles, but on the God who can take us through that carefully and give us that great comfort. In verse 10, he says, He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. Do you ever pray the Lord's Prayer? Lord, deliver us from evil. Same thing, same word in uh, the original languages. Same word. Why do we go through troubles? Why do we go through trials? I'll tell you why. Well, there's two reasons. First, you're human. These things come to everybody. The second reason is you belong to Jesus. If they crucify Jesus, they'll come after us because we don't belong to this world. We're different. We're other kinds of people. And so when these spiritual trials come upon us, Let's go back and find out, hey, God is the one who secures us. He's the one who raises the dead. He can get me through this. Whatever it might be, he's always there. He is the great comforter. And when I find out that there's somebody else going through the same difficulties, then I can go and comfort them. That's the whole process. God of comfort to us, to others. That's the, the plan. He, he basically says to us, I want you to be harmless in this world. How easy it is to retaliate. Many people in this room are hockey fans. He does it to me, I does it to him. Twice as hard. 
with the toys, right? That's hockey. Get in there, get in the wood. Well, we're in summertime now, we're not into hockey, but that's how, how hard it is not to retaliate in kind, but to take it. And then somebody stood up in a church meeting and said to this pastor, you're our servant, you'll do what we tell you to do. The amazing thing was that the pastor didn't retaliate. He sat there. He sat there. How hard it is. But with God's help, we can do it to keep God in our mind. Are you committed to Jesus? The first thing we learn is be committed to Jesus Christ. Begin my spiritual journey with him and continue my spiritual journey with him. But, but remember something. The early brethren used to say this, the need is not the call. There is always need around where we can break our heart and empty our pocketbooks and waste our life away and say, oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do that. I need to do this. I, did. I look like Ron Edgecombe, right? I'm just soft, running around. I need to do this. I need to do that. But God says to us, listen, find out what I really want you to do. Put that in your life. That's what motivated Paul. He was focused on doing that. Not on the church, how it uh, operated. He got that set up, then he went on someplace else. What does God call you to do? But first of all, be committed to Jesus. The Lord is my Savior. And then wait for him to direct you into what he wants you to do. First is be committed to, do, to Jesus. The second is be compassionate for Jesus, in the name of Jesus, to sit down beside people in trials. And sometimes that's a great big thing. Oh, it's dangerous. Uh, there are three things to keep in mind when, when you're thinking about being compassionate being committed. But the first thing is to pray. You didn't hear what I said. Is to pray. You see a need? Pray. Not pray, but pray. There's a new movie out. It's called Dunkirk. It's a story about Dunkirk, okay. About how in the beginning parts of the Second World War, a half a million men were pushed right into a very small area of France. May the 10th ended the phony war, if you know the history, and here it was the 16th, just less than two weeks later, and they were surrounded. What are they gonna do? King George VI, who was a Christian man as much as our queen is, both believers in Christ, he went on the radio and he called the nation to a day of prayer. And on the 26th of, of May, he called people to pray. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful we have more crises like this in Canada that we all prayed for? You couldn't buy a spot in church. People were there. Outside of Westminster Abbey, the king went in and his wife and they prayed. And you couldn't buy a seat in the play. The lineup was, oh, that's wonderful. Pray for deliverance. Did God hear? Three miracles happened. Three miracles. The first was, that the enemy forces around the city, they could have walked in there and captured half a million men. They didn't do that. They waited outside the city or the little township of Dunkirk. They waited. Didn't know why. They just stopped. Skirmishes on the outside, but they basically stopped. Which allowed them some time. 
Second miracle, there was a terrible, violent storm inland from Dunkirk. And the storm swept over and kept the enemy planes from flying over and bombing the soldiers that were right on the sand. A few of them got through, but the majority were grounded. The third miracle was that the notoriously weather-beaten English Channel became very calm, and there was a fog over top of it, which allowed the boats, the little boats, maybe that's the fourth miracle, the little boats from the Thames to go across to this big plume of black smoke. One of the pilots, Douglas Batter, said, you could have walked across the water on all these boats. There were so many of them, just little boats. And they rescued the men, 338,000 of them. When they thought maybe 20,000 could get off, it was a miracle. And then on the 9th of June, the king says, we go back to church today and thank God. Prayer is the first thing we do. Do you want me to get involved in this? Here's the situation. Do you want me to get involved in this? And to lay open your heart and say, God, is this what you want me to do? Nehemiah in the Old Testament, he was broken hearted over the broken walls of the city. And God says, good, I'll take you and be careful. God says, I'll take you from that foreign government over to do my job in Jerusalem. He may take you someplace else. What is your heart? Have you prayed about these things? First order of business of being compassionate is have your heart affected, but pray about it. Pray about it. Is it God want me to do this? The second is your presence with somebody. Being there. May I offer a piece of counsel? We knew all the words. We knew all the Bible verses. But sometimes just being there is all they need. And your presence there indicates your compassion for those people. God gave me comfort. I'm passing it on. But I don't have words for you at this time. But I'm here for you. Praying. What do you want me to do? Your presence to be with the people going through difficult. And then the practical. You got prayer. Presence and the practical. And the practical is, how can I help? How can I help? Can I provide food? Can I provide a helping hand? Can I do something with you as you go through this difficulty? God is a God of comfort. He, he wraps us up. And he says to us, listen, I want you to pass on that particular uh, snuggle to somebody else. That's why we got it. So we can pass it on. Not that we keep it to ourselves. Oh, not terrible. But to pass it on. So when we see a need, what can I do about it, God? What can I do about it? Can I go to that person and and help them, guide them, be with them. Take the step and then say, no, can I really do anything for you? Can I do anything for you? The prayer, the presence, and the practical help. Um, I love it when you actually listen to my messages. It happens sometimes, it just, uh... <coughs> anyway. Jeff phoned me and said, we had a little meeting ourselves and we sang some songs in our home. Some of you were there. And he said, can we sing that this morning? Well, we can't. I'll read the words. You think about it. Andre Grouch, 
Oh, sorry, Andre Crouch. Sorry, Crouch. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love to me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am, never hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. With his power he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life. Let me be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me to God. Be the glory for the things he has done. The God of comfort, Jesus, you are the God of comfort. Father, you're the God of comfort. Holy Spirit, you're the God of comfort. You've given it to us. And so, as Paul has instructed us in all the difficulty he had in his life, he's saying, I want you to spread it out. Spread it out. We pray to you that you will direct and guide us to the places you want us to serve you. We pray that where our presence might be there, if at all possible, to help and that practical help would flow from us. We are your people. You've given it all to us. And so we pass it on to the next person that is in need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we say, to God alone be the glory. Amen.